Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well. And that you're all having a fantastic day. Likes, comments, and subscriptions, as you know, are always very much appreciated as they do help out the channel. Welcome back to another News I Missed, where I go over. That's right, News I Missed. And without further ado, let's jump right in into it. Ripple partner Tranglo, that is T-R-A-N-G-L-O, has launched real-time cross-border payments in one of the fastest growing countries in the ASEAN region. I assume that's supposed to be ASEAN? Okay. Earlier, at the end of August, the company announced expansion into the UAE and the, on and the opening of a payment corridor there as well. This time is for Malaysia, but in a different way. Specifically, the innovation is that 80% of cross-border payments processed by Tranglo will be happening in real time. The upgrade was needed due to boom in real-time transactions in Malaysia. The breakthrough came thanks to Malaysia's central payment system, Paynet, which had previously implemented the Do It... Oh my gosh, it's called Do It Now... D-U-I-T now. <laughs> anyway, there's a song like that. Uh, do it now, real-time platform. As a result of these activities, real-time transactions have grown by 800% in three years and are expected to increase 3.5 times more by 2025. I really wonder what's supposed to be happening with the world in 2025. It's kind of one of those, maybe just like very round years. I know it's not a round number, but it's more of a, remember in 2018, in 2017, how everyone kept on talking about how crazy and different and fantastic and wonderful and how many new technologies we would have in the year 2020 and how this was going to happen. And I remember, you must remember it. We were supposed to have had self-driving cars, self-driving taxis. I watched a, a documentary because it's, it's all I'm doing. I, I just simply just watch documentaries all day. And there was one with this guy. Maybe it was even like a TED Talk or something where this guy was talking about how technology was going to advance. Like you've seen the charts like where it shows that parabolic curve going completely straight up and how AI would be able to help with this and that. And he was talking about the cost of like one microchip and how inexpensive it would be to actually create one. And it was something along the lines of, well, by the year 2020, the cost of one microchip will be one cent. And his idea was that historically before, it may have cost like $5 or $10 per chip and then $2. He's like, you know, we'll have the means to be able to, he said, he, and, and, and I remember this correctly because I was like, whoa, I want that. He said, you'd be able to like have wallpaper that would just be full of hundreds of chips and in the, in the chip, you know, it, it would be almost no extra cost because each chip was only one cent. And he was like, at will on your on your Apple Watch or whatever you know thing you had on your arm or even your phone, you'd be able to change the entire color of the entire room based on how you wanted it because the entire the wallpaper was basically its own computer that cost maybe an extra five or six dollars more because of the you know and it was all these kind of promises that we got about that year. To be fair, we were locked in our homes for about two years, give or take a year and a half. So you know maybe. All that stuff is still coming. But 2025 is also, you you notice it as well. Even in the cryptocurrency space, people are expecting prices to be above and beyond by 2025. The the people who are talking about releasing uh, things in technology or all these tech companies, everyone's talking about 2025 as this like monumental year. And I'm like nearly terrified of almost nothing happening because everyone uh, kind of keeps hyping it up so much about all the technology that we should have or will be getting but it's just a matter of, uh, I guess, just a matter of time. Tranglo, for its part, seeing prospects not only in Malaysia, but throughout the Asia-Pacific region, hopes to strengthen its position in the cross-border transfer market by introducing new and relevant technologies. Uh, there was another article that was floating around. It's not in this video. I'll try and find it again. Uh, it was talking about um, how well the company Ripple is doing, but how they're doing well having basically left the United States. It was something along the lines of like, they still have people working for them in the US, but they don't do business in the US. And I assume it's because of the, of the two year long $100 million lawsuit that's still ongoing by the SEC. 
It's very, it's very fascinating to see that after all these years, and after actually all these years, we heard so much hubbub and commotion as to what Ripple would be doing, how XRP would be used, how on-demand liquidity would be taking place and used by these banks and institutions and companies and people around the world. And now we actually see it happening. It's just quite fascinating. Uh, but more so, uh, it's, and I think of it this way. A lot of times we get really spectacular news in the cryptocurrency. And I mean, like, you've been here before. If you have been here before, thank you. Um, you've see, like, it's usually a wave of nothing but good news, keeping aside the FTX news because everyone's trying to make that as dramatic as humanly possible for the sake of, of, of whatever. Um, but over the course of time, like, we've seen that regardless of how good some news might be. After a two or three month period, people tend to forget. And then even when prices end up moving back up, everyone has forgotten the old news. So I wonder if XRP's price, because think of all the companies we've heard. It's, it's been at least two or three per week, at least on this channel that we hear who are using on-demand liquidity, which is another way of saying using XRP, formerly known as XRapid. So these companies are actually using XRP to actually send money around the world and stuff like that. But I wonder if the usage, or rather the price of the coin will go up based on the usage from these companies or from the remembrance of other people that they now have like 40 other partnerships uh, with big companies and also like countries around the world. Don't forget their, the, the news of their UAE partnership. Like they've partnered with multiple gigantic banks in the United Arab Emirates who are using actively XRP. Like we've heard about this before. We saw the articles and it's a matter of, you know, will the, you know, I always wonder, will the prices move? Because people forget good news very, very quickly. They hold on to bad news for as long as they can. I, I don't know if it's something with the, with the, the human psyche and being uh, desperate to be depressed. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's the Ripple partner. Tranglo is launching more cross-border payments in the ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N region. Yeah, wonderful. Keep, keep it going. Let's move on. Also in news, I'm a little skeptical on this one. Months after the Ethereum merge, where the network shifted to the more eco-friendly proof-of-stake consensus, the Ethereum community is now shifting its focus to redress the network's former proof-of-work carbon emissions since its launch. At the COP27 Climate Action event, Web3 firms, civil society leaders, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, called UNFCCC, announced the foundation of the Ethereum Climate Platform, ECP, that aims to counteract the carbon footprint of the Ethereum network since its launch in 2015. If this sounds a little bit weird to you as to why all this would be happening... I, I assumed years ago when we began to hear this is around 2017, 2018, uh, a lot of the news and a lot of new people who began to get into crypto, and this is more uh, richy rich kind of people, people who popped out of nowhere and were talking about uh, previously before how terrible crypto was, they began to all change their tune when it came to Ethereum. They were talking about Ethereum is the future, Ethereum is going to be this, this coin is going to be the greatest thing uh, that we've ever had in the entire world. And this, I also believe, then turned into the creation of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, people around the world, and I don't know if that's some of you, I do hope so, understand that the world is rapidly changing. We're not going to deeply get into it, but it has to do uh, with the climate. Um, however, a lot of people around the world are realizing that there actually is a problem. And I think they think one of the only real solutions to actual Ethereum adoption or cryptocurrency adoption is the idea uh, uh, that we're using it, but look at how much better it is than it was before. This is why we've seen such a huge push by Disney, by Facebook, by uh, all these other companies constantly announcing that they're either using Ethereum or that they're using um, Polygon. This is why we heard, I don't know if you saw the news, uh, Google is also running, um, Google and T-Mobile, you can Google that as well, uh, are both using uh, or running um, Ethereum validator nodes, and they only did so after Ethereum transitioned to proof of stake. So now the news story is, is that 
cool. We went to proof of stake. Carbon emissions are down by 99%. But what about the stuff from 2015 to the middle of 2022? Like, what about all the other stuff that was there? I, I think this is part of a wider campaign to kind of clean up the the image of the coin completely to show people, uh, you know, that it's kind of, how do I say it? They don't want any negative press. They want to be able to show that when they are and now using the coin and the, and the network in the future, that there's no negative pushback from people who are going to bring up a topic like, hey, but it was also messing up the world for the first seven years of its actual existence. Led by software company Consensus and climate-focused blockchain firm Alinfra, A-L-L-I-N-F-R-A, Alinfra, the founding members of the coalition includes a number of organizations, including Microsoft, Polygon, Aave, here we go, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, Global Blockchain Business Council, GBBC, Huobi, and Laser Digital. Once again, they're all using, and they have been using Ethereum for a number of years. This is not brand new news. I think it's brand new news, or will be eventually two people in the normal world who are not into crypto, that all these companies have been using blockchain and also mining cryptocurrencies for a uh, very long time. This is why we also see every time that a new company, even sometimes when you go over the news of companies who are uh, partnering with Ripple, they announce why they're using on-demand liquidity slash XRP. They talk about the carbon emission rate. It's kind of the, the forefront of what you need to say when you're announcing that you're going to be using crypto, because remember, even uh, during the advent or the beginning of the popularity of NFTs and everyone was like, oh, I hate them. Why do you hate them? Because they're on Ethereum. The idea of Ethereum was using too much electricity, too much car, blah, 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 all these other things. But now you realize that nearly that entire narrative, that entire negativity has almost disappeared. Look at all the companies who are talking about creating NFTs and creating metaverses and creating stuff like that. Where do they make sure that they're all announcing that they're going to be creating them? It's either on Ethereum or on Polygon. Nearly 99% of them. Of course, you may have the one company who's like, we're going to be building on X other coin. But even then, sometimes if you hear about new NFT platforms, it's usually only on proof of stake coins. This is kind of where the entire industry seems to be going. Using Web3 technology, funding mechanisms and governance protocols, the newly formed group will invest in climate projects that promise to mitigate Ethereum's past emissions. According to Ethereum co-founder and consensus CEO Joseph Lubin, while the merge set a high bar for climate mitigation, the climate crisis still requires more radical change. And I, and I think it's even a shame that this needs to be a discussion. Uh, as far as like, I've seen people before in the comment sections here or even on Twitter, because Twitter is probably one of the worst places on the planet right now, uh, making fun of people who are trying to like lower carbon emissions or actually, you know, you breathe in air, right? Like you, like listening to this right now, you know that you and your family breathe in oxygen. You know that when you walk down the street, you might be privileged enough to live in an area where you have tons of trees and forests and bears and, and lakes and stuff like that. But 90% of the world's population doesn't live in areas like that. And they breathe in the air that's coming out of every single car that passes by and it smells terrible. Have you been to parts of Asia? The air's brown. Like you look up and the sky is actually brown. I, I don't understand how you could... I remember there was something, last, last point, there, there was something, it was about two, no, it was more than two years ago. Some politician said something about how he didn't under, you know, he, he said he did not believe in climate change. And a lot of his followers went out in, uh, what are those gigantic, gigantic vehicles? Something along the lines of a Hummer, but also like a truck. I can't really explain what the car looks like. And these people went outside and just turned their cars on for 24 hours. They were just letting the engine run so that all the exhaust fumes. And it's like, you know, you were breathing in all of that. You were trying to prove it. It's, it's, the, the world is just so stupid. It's almost completely incomprehensible at this point. It's like, I don't understand how people can be actively proud of also being dumb. Like, you know, you breathe in air. Like, we can actually test air quality. It's not a matter of you believing in it or not. We can see that the air is dirty. I, I don't understand people at all. So this was quite popular news. 
This seems to be one of the other trends in the cryptocurrency space. I hope that they actually do something as far as we've heard of other companies before announcing that they're going to be uh, planning initiatives or will be starting something. But it's more of a, you, you know, it's cool that you're planning it, but can you actually do it? It's like before this was the beginning of the year when Ripple announced that they were going to be uh, using um, carbon offsets or something like that, which is also a scam. The idea is, uh, depending on how much carbon you've used or actually have pushed into the atmosphere, uh, anything else that you did not use, you can use as a carbon offset or, or was it a carbon tax or something like that. And you basically pay another company to be able to invest in a company that could potentially plant trees at some point to then offset the stuff that you used that year, which is nonsense. If you know how trees actually work, it takes 50 years of a tree growing to, and, and you know, uh, taking in CO2 and pushing out O2 to actually clean the thing that you did for that year. It takes a, one tree 50 years. It's not just about us having trees. It's about us having an abundance of trees. So not only can we breathe, but so the process also goes a lot faster. Um, anyway, that's the Ethereum software firm Consensus is launching the Ethereum Climate Platform. I hope they actually do something. Would be nice. Yeah. Let's move on. And, 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 and I know there's someone sitting there folding their arms going, I don't breathe air. And it's like, I don't. How can you actively be against yourself? It just doesn't make any sense. You breathe air. Like this isn't a discussion of if you eat some kind of food or not. Like you are actively now breathing in air as you are watching this. Is your air dirty? That's a problem. It needs to be fixed. Adidas Original, a German sportswear brand, unveiled the first blockchain-powered virtual wearables. Top sports brand Adidas dubbed its first collection of NFT wearables as virtual gear. The launch of the NFT collection accelerates Adidas Originals' drive to improve its community-based member-first open metaverse strategy. Why does this news seem familiar? Because Nike also is doing the exact same thing. You might remember we just had news from Nike that they also unveiled another wearable sports kind of collection. Both Nike or Nike, once again, depending on where you are, and Adidas are very heavily into the metaverse like they're not like you know like there's not a a toe in the door they have several hundred people executives people and workers you can even see like there's some photos of them like at meetings and stuff like that it is a very very big thing to them one of the main ideas for the metaverse uh, a lot of people don't think of this but it's like what you're going to wear we assume the avatars will not be just floating balls of light they are going to be based on people based on how you look and also a lot of people are going to want to dress a certain way inside of the Metaverse and Adidas and Nike have, you know, full force when it comes to these actual uh, collections and what they're doing. And they're actually super popular as well. Like they're not like small things. They've actually grown quite large in popularity. The 16 piece collection is available in the wallets of holders of its capsule collection, which debuted in May and was airdropped in two into the Metaverse NFT holders who seized phase two. The 16-piece collection represents a creative and cultural breakthrough, okay, in the brand's history, connecting past and future virtual and physical communities and creator culture and identity. That's saying a lot. Okay, you know, cool it down there. One of the main uh, focuses why a lot of people are actually into these projects is kind of the free money. I'm not sure if you saw the word right there, airdrop. I, I mentioned that before. Maybe I didn't. I don't remember. Between Nike and Adidas, they have an immense amount of airdrops. If you own their NFTs, uh, they begin to airdrop you like sneakers and like uh, p like portions of, uh, what do you call it? Um, like apartments, like pieces of a metaverse. Like it's really, really fascinating. But like this value is... Uh, a little, I guess the word would be contagious about how many people are now trying to accumulate them just to actually, because if, if these projects have only been around for like a year, year and a half, 10 years down the line, if metaverses have taken off, A, people are going to want the original collections and B, if you've already gotten six or seven airdrops from owning one thing that you bought back in 2021 and 10 years down the line, you'll probably have a different, uh, 100 different items from a collection. It's really fascinating to think about. While speaking on the launch of NFT wearables, the vice president of Adidas, Erica Weixneyde, that is W-Y-K-E-S-S-N-E-Y-D, 
YXC. Anyway, she said, I love the opportunity this collection represents for our most engaged community of holders. Every capsule holder has a choice at launch. Burn and express their virtual identity with Adidas's first virtual gear collection. Or list and allow others to join this community with our community and creator ecosystem at a core. No, okay, she, she's, she's saying a lot of stuff. That's, that, that's far too many words. So cool. Yeah. Adidas has um, dropped their... Uh, no, it is not their first NFT collection. Adidas has had their NFTs since, I believe, even 2020. It's been a while now. This is their first wearable collection that they have because in the future they believe everyone is a going to be inside of a metaverse and also b going to be wanting to wear their stuff so i guess it logically kind of makes sense yeah that's the adidas nft collection airdrop news yeah let's move on also in the news ripple the U.S.-based tech firm has said its crypto solution known as ODL, or on-demand liquidity, is set to help MSF Africa streamline real-time mobile payments for customers in 35 different countries. The development of Ripple's partnership with MSF Africa, has, which has 800 payment corridors across, English, across the continent, will ostensibly see the whole region uh, getting a chance to reap the financially inclusive... I hate when people talk like that. It's very, very... It, it's always very cringy for me to hear people saying things like financial inclusion. I, I don't know. Like, I believe in the idea, of course, of financial inclusion is one of the main uh, ethos eth ethos of uh, Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency space, but I feel like so many companies use it as a way to be like, oh, look, we're helping. I don't know. It's always kind of kind of cringy. As part of the agreement, MSF Africa, a leading fintech group on the continent, will use Ripple's crypto solution known as on-demand liquidity. Commenting on MSF Africa's decision to partner with Ripple, the mobile financial solution company CEO Dave Okuju said, MSF Africa's mission is to make borders matter less when it comes to payment within, to, and from Africa. We're delighted to advance this mission through our partnership with Ripple to enable fast, secure, and low-cost remittances at scale. The CEO added that the firm's partnership with Ripple represents its first attempt at using blockchain technology to amplify our, their, MSF Africa's impact on consumers and businesses on the continent growth in a new economy. So two, or rather one, that is another company or the second company that we're hearing about right now that is also going to be using on-demand liquidity. I have a question, and I think this is actually quite pertinent to the, to the entire discussion. We often hear of the idea, so remember like years ago, uh, there was a situation where there were people in Asia who were trying to do business, and they found out that it was a lot easier for them to simply actually swap their money into Tether to be able to use or transact between each other as opposed to having to go to the local currency exchange, give them paper currency, get paper currency back, and then do business this way, and then going back across the border and changing it back into the original currency, it takes a long time. So they began to simply use Tether, and this was very swiftly made illegal uh, by two countries. One starts with a Rus, and the other one starts with a Chai. Right. Um, and this is why I believe that um, the latter... Uh, also actually ended up making their central bank digital currency quite quickly. Part of the idea for me has always been, uh, we have crypto. There's no real, real need for a remittance company. However, taking a step back, I understand that people are a lot more confident and a lot more comfortable with using a company to send money. We've been conditioned with the idea that the only way to store money is with a third party. And the only way to send money is through that third party as well. It's not our fault. It's just simply what we've been learning for the last about four or 500 years. That's how the system actually is. The fact that we have cryptocurrencies right now has always been like a really major thing for me. Why? Because at any given time, I can simply use XRP or any other coin to send to you directly. There's no, you know, third party, you know, you can see, see the validators as a third party, but not really. It simply will go to you. That's how it works. You can also choose to send me XRP. 
when we normally hear about um, coin usage around the world, especially when it pertains to uh, Bitcoin and like, hey, this country looks like it's collapsing or that fiat currency seems to be going down. The news story that tends to follow is like people in that country are accumulating large amounts of Bitcoin. People within Venezuela are now mining their own Bitcoin. They have one machine, they're creating it, and they use Bitcoin to transact between themselves and other people around them, depending on the time of day, whatever, blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. They're using it as an actual currency. The point of XRP, as far as I understand, is to be used by institutions and banks to send money around the world. I find it really weird that no one has presented or started the narrative of XRP just being used as a normal coin similar to Bitcoin, i.e., you know how people are always like, hey, you can pay now in Dogecoin, you can pay now in Shiba Inu, Terra Luna Classic is now a payment method, Bitcoin can now be used on this website, you can now pay in Ethereum, you can use Polygon as a payment method. I don't often hear people being like, oh, XRP is now the, the payment method, or people around, like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, the, the, the entire um, history and mythology around Bitcoin and many other coins, what have you, is that they can be used by people around the world in the event of an actual emergency or they need to do it to transfer value. One of the issues, air quoting here, with Bitcoin, and this is why we see Lightning having such a gigantic push in the last couple of months, is that if you're transferring Bitcoin to someone, sometimes it takes a long time, depending on which, you know, how, you know, uh, it may take 10 minutes, 15 minutes for the like for, for the finality of the transaction to go through so that you have received the coins and you can actually use it. And at that time, the price of the coin might have actually moved. It's just logical. Bitcoin moves a lot. The idea of using XRP for remittances is that XRP is supposed to be so fast that there is no actual change in price. You get it like in an instant and therefore you can transact in that value the same exact way that you got it. I find it weird that no one has pushed forth the idea in any way, and I mean even more so like, you know, Ripple as a company or anyone else of XRP simply being used by everyday normal people. You understand what I'm saying? It's kind of like a, we hear a lot about these coins or even Tether or Bitcoin or Ether or whatever other coin is being used behind the scenes as like an immediate solution to inflation for other countries. Even XRP's price isn't as volatile as Bitcoin. I find it kind of interesting that no one has thrown forth the idea of like, hey, just j just send me XRP. Just send me XRP really quickly. Like, like you don't need a remittance company. So not only would this improve the image of XRP as a currency, like an actual like usable fast currency as opposed to just being used by institutions and banks, but when you can prove... Also, that there are hundreds of millions of people or even just simply millions of people around the world who are using your coin for payments. It also increases the idea of decentralization. If all the coins are stuck in one place, it doesn't seem very decent. It's, it's, it's very... Isn't that weird? Over the last six years, we've heard no news of anything like that where Ripple or any other company, any other company has pushed forth the idea because we hear it quite often... We heard it from Charles Hoskinson as far as like uh, Cardano or ADA, the coin, actually being used in Africa as, as a payment method. Years ago, we heard about Dash and many other coins and Litecoin being used in Latin America. Huh. Very fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that that hasn't been a trend or people being like, especially from like from people who love XRP. Wouldn't you realize like... I'm surprised that there isn't a thing where people are like, just simply use XRP as your payment method or a way to transact between you and friends around the world as opposed to using Bitcoin. Not a rant, but more of a, it's weird, right? There's so many people who love XRP, like the whole XRP community. But over the years, I've paid attention and it's just like internal fighting between them as to how high the coin's price is going to go, what ripple the company is doing. But there's never been like, oh, let's actually start campaigns to get people around the world who don't have access to financial communities or to banks, let them know and learn about XRP so that they can use it. Okay, I'm done. But like, you understand what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. 
So Ripple, the company, continues to expand. But I find it like the, the XRP coin burn could be monstrous right now. If there had been a campaign that had been started by the community five years ago, it would be gigantic. With hundreds of thousands, if not low millions of people actually using XRP and realizing how fast it is comparative to Bitcoin. And they would simply be using that instead. Ah, weird to think about, right? Yeah, that's the Ripple has partnered with MSF Africa, and they are going to be using on-demand liquidity slash XRP uh, to help people in around 35 different countries uh, have access to real-time mobile payments. Yeah. Let's move on. Right. I do hope that you've all enjoyed. I do hope... Geez, geez these lines are long. I do hope that you all are having a great day, a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I hope it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, or supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.